AI right now feels like this extremely expensive uh, technology. But if you look back uh, when Google acquired YouTube, I think this is a good analogy of what we're experiencing today. Because at the time... All right, Michael, thank you so much for coming. I'm really excited to talk to you. I love Height. I think it's the best product in the market. And you have an eye for designs. Uh, I've seen you, your posts on designing the Stripe dashboard for iPhone to even build height. Your work has always had attention to detail in building products. How do you balance the attention to detail in, in, in products versus building new products and fe features? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the compliments. Um, and I'm super happy to be here. So yeah, I've been working on software for a long time. Um, actually, I, I started when I was a student, I, I think I was around 18 years old and I built this photo gallery uh, that was online. Yes. You can download it and you can put it on your websites. And being a student, I could spend as much time on the details as I wanted. Uh, I think it took me a few years to finally get it out and sell it to customers. Uh, it was worth it though, because people really liked it. So I really took this and kept it uh, as I shipped other stuff in, in the future. Um, then I graduated from college and I started working with my good friend, Benjamin. Um, we co-founded Kickoff together. It was a Mac app to collaborate with chat and tasks. And I think Ben and I really clicked because we had this attention to detail in common. So it was really easy again to spend a long time uh, polishing Kickoff and we didn't have any pressure. We didn't have any investors, no deadlines. So I think it, uh, it took us again like a year and a half to, to ship Kickoff and then a year and a half again to ship Kickoff 2. Uh, it was all worth it. I still love the product. Um, and then we got acquired by Stripe. I moved to San Francisco and Ben and I still worked on a few software there. The first one being Stripe Checkouts. Uh, that was my first project there and it was just the two of us. And we spend a few months prototyping ideas because at the time we were trying to figure out how to make the mobile experience, like mobile checkout experience faster. So we introduced this concept called Remember Me. I think they call it linked now. Um, and that was, that was great. Like we'd spent a, a, lo a long time just exploring ideas and polishing the details of the flow. And then we also worked on Stripe for iPhone that you mentioned. Uh, this one was a bit different because it's not something that we just thought would be cool. It's something that customers needed. Customers really wanted an iPhone app and it's been, it's been used, they asked for it. And so we started working on it, but with something in the background that was kind of like customers asking for it and just pushing, push, pushing us to ship it, right? So that's the first time that I really felt the balance of polishing and it's like having some kind of like deadline um, outside pressure. And then obviously I worked on other software at, uh, at Stripe, uh, one being Stripe Atlas. So Stripe Atlas is a website to encourage your company. And I jumped, joined the project a bit late. So I think when I joined, we had like three or four months left before shipping. And there was an actual deadline. I think we were announcing at some conference. And so that was the actual first time that I really had to decide what will make it to the, to the final product. Um, I left Stripe then and founded Heights, a uh, collaboration so software tool. And I think that changed a lot again because I'm the founder now, I'm the CEO and I'm managing a team. So like the attention to detail is pushed more on the team. Um, and so I'm really trying to do, address trade-offs here, like uh, how much do I want to push the team to polish things compared to shipping to actual customers, especially as we're like uh, early startup, we are still sometimes trying to figure out, uh, is this feature worth it? And then we test it with a few tests, a uh, few uh, beta testers. Um, it's only if, it's, if it clicks, if uh, it works for these users that we will spend more time on it and polish it to the maximum. Interesting. And you've mentioned the Remember Me feature on Stripe, uh, which I think you mentioned that it's called Link right now. Can you go into a little bit more detail 
what it was and why it took such a long time to build. I mean, comparatively to the other features you're building for for the Stripe checkout. Yeah, so we worked on Stripe checkout in 2013. So in 2013, uh, the mobile web was getting bigger and bigger. And we realized that it was actually really painful to buy stuff on different websites, especially on websites that you've never been into. So you have to put your first name, last name, you know, all your credit card information, your billing address, and so on. And so what we wanted to do is unlock one-click payment, but across different websites. So let's say you buy something on the chocolate store and then you go you know, on the tech, tech store. If it's the same form, you, you would have one-click payment. And it was not obvious how to do this. Uh, so the, the obvious way is to just like ask your email and passwords and you create an account and that's what PayPal did. But we, want, we didn't want that. Like we, we realized that a lot of people don't like passwords and they just forget them. So that would just kind of reduce the appeal uh, and make it less effective. And so we came up with phone number and send you a, a, like a code, basically like a six digit code. And like now it seems obvious, uh, there's a lot of like companies that do this. There's also like two factor auth that's much more widely adopted, but you know, like 2013 again, like that's 11 years ago. Um, so yeah, it, it took us some time to just get to that point. And then when we realized that we had something, we started building a few prototypes um tested it internally uh with some merchants even new hires like we we tested it with some of them um and then obviously like it's a checkout form so we wanted to get it as polished as we want it as, as you could since you know it's it's the end of a long journey on the website right like let's say you buy shoes you're gonna select your shoe and you which color which size oh no actually i want this one it's cheaper uh, and the last step is literally putting in credit card information. So the worst case scenario is actually a user dropping in that stage after spending 20 minutes on the website. So that's where you can spend a long time working on this checkout form because that's where it really matters. Uh, it needs to feel polished, it needs to be fast, it needs to feel secure because you're putting your credit card info in it. Um, so yeah, it took, it, it took quite, a, quite a time. Yeah, that's awesome. So you talked a little bit about the, the process that you had to go through to build the, the checkout flow. Uh, there's, you also been involved in building the Stripe dashboard for the iPhone and even on building height as a product. Uh, I imagine there is some kind of product flow. Uh, at the time, uh, I read a post uh, by you that you first build wireframes then you have the visual design and then the interactions. Is that the way you build products now? And how has it changed over time? Actually pretty different these days. Um, you know, we're not doing like wireframes on paper anymore. Um, we just use Figma. So like on, on Figma, everyone can just collaborate in real time. Um, it, it's nice because it's also higher fidelity. So you can just, you know, use your component library and create some you know, quick prototype uh, of a feature. I think that helps everyone like designers and engineers to understand what a feature could be. Um, other differences are that on Stripe for iPhone, it almost felt like a B2C software where like a person would not use the iPhone app for hours and hours a day. They would have really simple workflows, right? Like if they might check their balance or refund a customer, they're really simple actions that, that might take a few seconds. But in the project management software, like you, we have some users that spend hours every day on it. Uh, and each of them have different workflows. They're much more complex. They're managing teams that have different needs. So we spent a lot, of more, a lot more time on the core UX than you know, the animation duration, for example, of a transition, right? Uh, we still do some of that, but that might be 10%, you know, of our, of our time, 90% on understanding our users, you know, do, doing user research uh, with them and understanding their, their workflows and what their problems are. Um, I guess another difference is that on Stripe, I, Stripe for iPhone, like it was me and Ben, especially in the beginning, I think the first six months, it was just the two of us. And so it was easy to, to, to collaborate. It was just two people, everyone had 
the full information. Um, there was one designer, one engineer. Uh, there was no confusion there. But in a bigger team, there can be some desync and making sure that uh, the product you're shipping as the at the quality that you expect can be difficult. Um, so we we introduced a few workflows that I think work pretty well at Heights. One being product reviews. So we have like, these time slots on the calendar or everyone's calendar actually that you can join uh, if you if you want to and you can present what you're working on. So you know it, it could be like extremely early MVP of what you're building uh, or a Polish design that you want to have feedback on and, and the product team just give feedback. And it, it, I think it helps having everyone on the same page of what, what is the quality that we want out. Um, we also use that meaning to just be aware of everything that's shipping, right? So everyone is, is supposed to at least come to product review at some points during the developments. So I think it helps the product team understand and have like full understanding of the product. Another workflow we do is uh, async videos. Like uh, obviously we are a remote company and we work across different time zones. Uh, so like all, all the time zones in the US, but also some uh, people are in Europe. So having a way to just send, you know, a quick two minute video and asking for feedback on what you're working on. I think it's really helpful, especially for anything that's uh, front end, you know, like UI, uh, there's, there's really nothing else that you can do except, you know, like pushing to prods to users. Um, so I think it's, I think videos is really nice uh, to just get feedback really fast. Um, and, and I mean, of, of course, uh, we, we're building with AI uh, and AI being extremely new. I think product building with AI is, is very different and we're still exploring how to do this. Uh, what I think one difference is that you cannot just stay in Figma and building like and design an AI feature. Like it's not something that is go is going to work because you actually have to experience AI yourself. Like you have to, you know, try different prompts and see what is possible. And actually, that is part of the the feature building process. Uh, so now it's, it's it's actually I would argue that building products in the AI world is actually a lot more complicated because now there's there's many uh, things to do. It's not just, you know, like Figma and then engineering. It's like, you know, this Figma and then, oh, we have to try on, on like, you know, GPT, if you use GPT, like uh, OpenAI, uh, if it works, uh, and then you maybe some engineering, then come back to design. And so it's, it's a big loop, uh, between the, the three, uh, three things. Interesting. You've mentioned that you use a lot of AI tools, in, including, let's say, ChatGPT or Claude. Is that to basically write the application, the code initially, or is that for something different? Were you using uh, AI tools specifically for building new products? Yeah, so we use GitHub Copilot to write a lot of codes um, uh, on the engineering side. I'm, I'm, I feel like this is like actually the best AI tool out there uh, currently. Then obviously ChatGPT, which is uh, a lot more flexible. You know, we use it for marketing tasks, uh, even some engineering tasks. But mainly what I meant by that is that at Heights, we are using new models to build features for our own customers. Um, so we actually do a lot of testing with different models to you know, try if a feature can be done today or if it's like too early. Uh, maybe we'd have to wait you know, for GPT-5 for this feature. And the only way to actually know this is actually to build the feature, right? Uh, it's not just by designing, you know, the, the UI that you're going to know if the feature can be built today. Um, I feel like that's like a big difference between building products without AI and building products with AI is that you actually don't know if it's going to work until you actually do it. Um, we also built an internal tool to build these features faster and also to improve collaborations between uh, engineering and design and products, since you really have to go through this, uh, this cycle of like, oh, design, you know, changing the prompts, uh, or maybe we need more data. So engineering is involved and come back to design again. Uh, the tool has been like extremely useful, uh, internally to like actually, uh, work on high 2.0. And then in general, I think it's also a culture 
uh, thing at our company to just encourage everyone to use AI uh, for their day-to-day -day tasks. Um, I, I feel like it's so early that many people actually don't know what is possible with AI yet. And so by using AI every day on, on what you have to, to work on, it can unlock like ideas of what could be used uh, for customers and what kind of features we can build. Yeah, one of uh, my favorite products of last year as well is Perplexity. Um, and the reason for that is because you can basically ask for information that's current and it's going to basically pull the information from the web. And whenever I want to figure out something that's like more current and, and, and I want the sources and things like that, I use Perplexity. I also use uh, ChatGPT, but, but I've, I've been using more and more products that, you know, have LLMs integrated into them. Awesome. Um, let's go over the journey that you embarked building startups, working at Stripe. Stripe now processes, uh, they announced recently that I think they process around $1 trillion of, of, of volume through their platform. And you've worked there, you know, uh, 12 years ago, 10 years ago. Um, what lessons have you learned at Stripe that you still carry today? Uh, probably that hiring your friends is a good strategy for success. Um, our Stripe is like both of the co-founders are brothers, right? Um, but they also hired a lot of their friends in the original team. Uh, and I think that really helped keeping people for a long time, you know, um, I think it's also really fun to work with friends, uh, compared to people you might not know that might not click right away. And so at Heights, I actually didn't plan that. I, I didn't think about it too, too much before starting the company. But then when I, when I, uh, wanted to hire my first employee, uh, my brother became available. And so we started discussing and we never thought that working together was going to be <laughs> like part of the plan or part of like a good idea, but it ended up being really awesome. And then we replicated that multiple times. We hired one of our good friends from high school. And then my wife joined as a CEO, um, and it's been great um, all along. Another thing that's great is that they give me feedback all the time. And I feel like that might not happen if you don't hire your friends. Like, the, like people might feel a bit more stressed to give like actual feedback to the CEO. CEO. Um, so that, that's been great. Um, I think another thing is that Stripe hired a lot of founders uh, originally, like ex-founders. And so a lot of us had a lot of um, ownership and entrepreneurship into what we're doing at Stripe. So things like me and Ben working on Stripe for iPhone or, you know, like Stripe checkouts, it, it really came from the fact that we were like ex-founders, right? Um, we, we wanted to ship this, we wanted to like create this new product and we didn't need too much um, management to get there. And it's something that I tried to replicate a little bit at Heights by giving a lot of ownership to our engineers and designers. And the way that we do it is that each engineer and designer is really assigned to you know, one project and they really own this project from beginning to end. Um, I think it helps giving autonomy to people so that they can really shine. And like, if you trust them, and that's what you get the most value out of them, I guess. That's super interesting. That's contrary to some, what some people say. And I mean, if you look around, there is Stripe, even YC was started by Paul Graham and his wife, which is uh, very, very interesting. So let's go over some, some details, um, on height and, and, and and the details that you build into the product, uh, Height 1.0. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the details that make make it special? So I came across, for example, the way you design scroll bars uh, and the way it delights users in different platforms. Yeah, the custom scroll bars is uh, pretty interesting. We wanted to make them consistent across platforms. 
So across you know Mac, Windows, Linux, but also even on the same platform, you might have different scrollbar. Like if you have a mouse pad, or if you have a cords like um, a mouse with like a scroll wheel. And having a different experience across platform is actually really annoying when you're trying to build a UI um, because some components might uh, react differently. Something else we wanted to do is solve uh, overflowing context menus. Um, context menus, when they get really long, and there's a few ways you can make them overflow. Um, most of the time, there's like a little arrow at the bottom and you hover the, the arrow and then it's gonna scroll one by one. But we thought like, why not scroll bars? I, I thought, it, 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 I haven't seen this ever, um, but I thought it would be a good idea. And it turns out it works really well. And then the third, third thing is some platforms like on Mac, um, it's pretty difficult to discover when content is scrollable. So I don't know if you noticed, but if you go on the finder, for example, like there's actually two areas that's scrollable, right? There's a style bar, and then there's like the list of files. And you really expect the list of files to be scrollable because it looks like one, but the sidebar is actually scrollable too. And the only way to know that is actually to try it. Um, if you don't try it, you, you're not gonna know on, on Mac. So what we did is when you hover a piece of content that's scrollable, we actually just show the scroll bar at that time. Um, so it's not just visible when you scroll. And I think the only way to get this right is actually to build them custom. Um, other details we did are uh, custom customizable shortcuts. Uh, something I got inspired by from video games. Uh, you know, like when you set up, set up a video game, you directly go into settings and check the keyboard shortcuts. Uh, sometimes you, you change them, sometimes not, but mostly you want to see the features, you want to see what you can do and achieve really fast. And I think it applies to power apps, you know, like apps that you use hours a day, you know. So obviously on Gmail, you know, you, you, you can use shortcuts and you have a little uh, shortcut panel, but you cannot customize them. And so on, like, on, uh, on Heights, you actually can, you, there's, there's some actual actions that don't have any shortcuts, so you can add a shortcut uh, if you use that action a lot. And yeah, I thought that was pretty cool for, you know, power users. Um, but at the end of the day, in software like Heights, um, a lot of the details are not put into, you know, just UI. It's it's a lot of uh, making sure that workflow work really well for users. Um, so like, I'm, I'm thinking like details like our statuses. Our statuses actually work across teams. So like a status of a task, I mean, um, you know, like to do, you know, in progress, done. Um, some teams some teams might have different statuses and. The, uh, the, the basic thing to do is like, oh yeah, we'll allow this team to have statuses and we'll allow this other team to have statuses. But we made it work so that a task can move from team to team. Uh, and so we built statuses that work across teams, which means that every team can have their own statuses, but the statuses still works uh, when you move a task from another. Um, so that, I thought that was a, a really cool detail, but it's not something you see right away when you use height, right? Like when you start using height, you see it's a simple task list. And the more you use it, the more you realize uh, the, of the power and all of, the, all of these details. Um, so things like, you know, customizing the task list to a different visualization, and maybe, you know, you don't want to see the completed task since last Monday or things like that. And those are all the details we push uh, a lot of effort into. Very interesting. So. You've been building height for some time now. What are the biggest lessons that you've learned building it from scratch? Yeah, so I've been building heights uh, you know, as a flexible tool uh, since the start. But it's only when you start talking to users and they share the screen that you realize how flexible it is because they have these uh, crazy workflows. You know, they've been using height for months, sometimes years, and they really use this our features in ways that I didn't expect. Uh, so like they combine them to, to create their own workflows. Um, it's also cool because you start talking to them and you start learning of what other features they might need, or maybe other customers like them will need at some point. Um, but then 
other things uh, can also affect your business and uh, it's also something that I didn't think a lot like when I started Heights is uh, external factors, right? So, so things like COVID and remote work would it change the way that you, people use project management tools? Um, and then even more recently is uh, the whole AI movement, you know, like new LLMs coming, ev coming out every six months. Um, and we really see an opportunity for project management. Um, the, the, we think that project management could be very, very different uh, in, in 10 years and that AI could really uh, change the way that we manage projects. Um, so I've been really excited about this. Um, and obviously you have to mostly stick to your plan. You cannot change your business every time something new comes out. But sometimes, you know, like that one thing that might just change the game. So yeah, that's, that's super interesting. Yeah. So let's talk about AI since you mentioned that has been a big change. So height 1.0 has released a lot of AI features into the product. What are some of the surprising learnings with the usage of customers of these AI features? Yeah, so about a year and a half ago, we started experimenting, experimenting with AI. Uh, and I think at the time it was GPT 3.5 or 3. And we did a hackathon. And the hackathon script, like prompt was uh, built, you know, something with AI. And we already had some some interesting things like we had a, a, like task to assigning themselves and so on, but we thought that AI was not there yet. Like it was not like at the level that we thought would be really useful for users. Um, so we waited a little bit. And actually, what's interesting is that every three to six months, there's like a new LLM coming out these days, right? And basically, I think it was like four or five months later, GPT four came out. And so we looked at this hackathon again and realized, wait, actually, I think we, we can make this now. I think this feature, this feature is actually viable. So we ended up doing a three month sprint and build about 10 features, uh, based on AI. So things like automatically deduplicate tasks, uh, automatically creating team standups, uh, summarizing your chat, chat conversation. So you can catch up, uh, of what have been said recently. And the idea of this was to convince ourselves that GPT-4 or, or later would be good enough so that we can basically reinvent project management. And after building these 10 features, we started talking to our users and some of our features really resonated, like uh, chat summary or, you know, deduplicate task that, that, that we built in a way that brought a lot of value to our users. Um, and so I thought, that based on this feedback, uh, it was worth thinking of what height could be if we build it from the AI perspective, you know, like what can be done now that the AI exists instead of just like stacking features on top of our existing products. And so that's how we're designing height 2.0, uh, basically like project management, but you know, with AI. Awesome. Uh, yeah, some of these features that are released in Height 1.0, I really, really love the summarization, like Catch Me Up uh, is really, really uh, useful. And sometimes I'm like, there's so much conversation going on. I'm like, just just tell me what's important. And, and it, it basically summarized. That's like super nice. How do you think about the costs associated uh, with the like running these LLMs since some of these inference costs can add up? Yeah, that's an interesting question because I think AI right now feels like this extremely expensive uh, technology. But if you look back uh, when Google acquired YouTube, I think there's a good analogy of what we're experiencing today. Because at the time, a lot of people were thinking that YouTube actually went crazy of have acquired YouTube uh, because of the bandwidth cost. It was really expensive to run YouTube. And they didn't know what Google knew is that bandwidth cost would go down like crazy in the next decades. So I think we can apply this to AI as well, where currently it does feel crazy to integrate AI in every piece of your products. And it feels like it's really expensive. So you want to move that cost to the user, but actually it's to me, it feels like a mistake because AI will probably go down in pricing. And what you want to do actually today is actually build a product 
that feels native with AI. Something that you cannot get rid of the AI, you cannot just sell half of the products and that will make products much better over the long term. So I think pricing AI as an add-on feels like the wrong strategy if you want to build the next generation software. Um, just because from the user perspective, it looks like AI is optional. And from your perspective, you can actually build a software that feels extremely integrated with AI because you always have to have a feature with AI and without it. So let's talk about the future of AI and how it will affect the tech industry and product management. So, I mean, we started to see, you know, LLMs, which are these language models and chatbots and things like that. And we were starting to see agents and it's just the early glimpse. So Cognition Labs has this um, demo of Devin, which is this tool that can actually code for you. How do you think AI agents and AI will change product management and the tech industry in, in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, I think a lot of the AI agents will actually do the repeated tasks that humans don't like to do. So things like archiving your spam email in the, in the inbox in the morning, or filling, filling out a form, extracting information and putting in a database, right? Um, I think in project management, there's actually a lot of these tasks that are really repetitive. Um, and currently, like a project manager will have a script in their heads and, you know, every time something happens, they will just apply that script. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think that's why AI agents can really do this, this task is we just have to extract the scripts from our head and putting it into an AI. And uh, so for example, in project management, triaging bugs is something that I can think of that really applies this script where a task comes in, you have to decide, oh, should I redirect this to a different team? Maybe it's, our team is not uh, li liable for this bug, right? Or assign the correct teammates that have worked on the feature linked to this bug. Or finding a priority. Is it a critical bug, you know, that, assign, that, that was affecting a lot of users? So a bug, for example, linked to sign up or, or login, like, you know, you have to work on uh, today. So right now, I feel like a lot of people in small startups, you know, like PMs or CEOs, like they do some of this project management themselves because we don't have a dedicated project manager. And so the goal of Heights is to become this AI agent that takes a lot of this project management out of product management, right? Like I want to focus on the products and on the vision of the company and leave, you know, all the project management's repetitive tasks to height. Um, that's, that's awesome. That's super interesting. Yeah. I, I, I really uh, think that, that AI tools will be like very focused. So if you think about law, there's Harvey, if you think about product management, there's height. And maybe if you think about coding, there's a GitHub Copilot. But that's that was super interesting. Thank you, Michael, so much for your time. I really, really, really appreciate it. It was such a nice and, and interesting conversation. I've learned a, a ton from you. Uh, where can people find... Thank you. Where can people find you online? And where can people find more about Height and, and you? Oh, thank you. Thank you for so much for having me. Um, yeah, you can find me on threads at Michael Villar. And obviously go on Height.app to sign up for the waitlist. Awesome. Thank you so much again.